That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Can you hear me yet? We're coming on, aren't we? That song makes me want to get a nice cuppa. You're teaching me words. I can't tell you all the words you've taught me, but you've taught me some words. The one that, well, I'm not going to say that now. Later we'll talk about the words you've taught me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. When I was a child, I thought all the sin was locked up in one pub in the neighborhood. It's called the Green Spot Tavern. We drove by every day, back and forth to school, back and forth to church, back and forth to Pathfinders, back and forth to Potluck, back and forth to In Gathering, back and forth and back and forth. I knew all the sin was locked up in the green spot. It was one pot a mess. I imagined the sinners and the prostitutes and the tax collectors were all there. The building beat, just you could see it throb with the music from the inside and On the outside of the building, the gutters kind of hang low and some light bulbs need to be changed. And on the weekends, the cars would pack in and park every which way. When I passed the Green Spot Tavern, all my little girl's mind could think was, whatever you do, don't go close to the Green Spot. Proximity solves the problem, right? If the Green Spot is where all the problem is, then proximity solves the problem. What was the little song we referenced on Sabbath morning? Oh, be careful, little feet. Yep. If you, if you yelp them today, that's our favorite uh, app of choice, right? If you yelp them today, the green spot still exists. Now they're called The Spot. They get 4.8 Yelp review, and they serve apparently really good chicken wings on the weekend. <laughs> to my little girl's mind, though, North American conservative Christianity... All I could hear was the text from Jesus, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is the oldest translation we know, the King James Version. And to a little girl raised in Adventist culture and tradition, all I could think was these poor people must not have Sabbath school teachers to help them. They must not have people who open the Bible to show them, Why are you in the green spot? I also had the voice of another one in my mind. This one from Ellen White, which we read in Christ's Object Lessons. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in her people, then what happens? He comes to claim them as his own. Do you know this passage also? I'm guessing that all of us who showed up at at camp here in New Zealand know both these passages. Be therefore perfect, And when you are, the character of Christ can be perfectly revealed, and thank God Jesus could then come. This morning, I want to talk about these two texts side by side. We have a relationship with this passage, and we have a relationship with Ellen White. And when I need help, I turn to the voice of Jesus. I understand that's what this Vision 2020 is about, what your conference leadership had in mind. When we, turn, when, when we are confused or we need to turn for help, that we would turn to Jesus. So we open the words of Jesus this morning, not Jesus through the voice of Augustine in the 4th century, a church theologian, not Jesus through the voice of Aquinas in the 13th century, another theologian, not Jesus in the 19th century through the voice of Ellen White, not Jesus through the voice of any other Adventist church leader in the 40s, 50s, 60s, not questions on doctrine, not any independent ministry today who claims to know what Jesus wants in a last movement. We need to hear the voice of Jesus first. So we open the Gospel of Matthew, where Matthew's Jesus is just getting ready to stand up and announce his movement. Jesus has come from the wilderness. He's been out with it, tempted, the one tempting him, the evil one. He's been offered three things at least, the whole world. Jesus has left the wilderness 40 days. He's home. He's come to get a home-cooked meal, do his laundry maybe, sleep, get a hug from his mama, right? The Bible doesn't tell us all those small things. 
Now Jesus is ready to stand up in Matthew's gospel. Remember, there are five long lectures in Matthew's gospel. Think of him like a, he's a professor or a lecturer, and he gives us five large chunks of lectures. This is lecture one, lesson one. Jesus is about to stand up. Peter, James, John, Andrew, they're in the front row, the disciples sitting there on the hillside waiting to hear. This is when you announce your program. This is when you announce your platform. This is what you say, what the party is about, what the movement stands for. This is Jesus' moment. He can say anything. Do you remember that part of Matthew's gospel? He can say anything, and he starts with blessed. Blessed are the grieving ones. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst today. Blessed are those of you among who... um, who show mercy, blessed are those with pure hearts, blessed are the ones who make peace, blessed are the ones harassed because of righteousness, blessed are you when people insult you because of me, because that could happen, because it happened to the prophets before all of us. Blessed, 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 we will all be blessed when we step into this realm, the kingdom of God. This is what we call the Jesus movement, and Jesus declares divine blessing now on people who would attempt to live this life with God, the way Jesus is about to show them how to do, right? If you commit to this movement, it'll be risky. What Jesus says now are some of his most difficult and demanding instructions, friends. This is not the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are baby food. What Jesus says next are some of his most demanding instructions. Turn the other cheek. Walk another mile. Give your extra coat. Love your enemies. Sit with those who hate you. The cluster of command Jesus gives right here in this section of Matthew's gospel are dense and heavy and thick, and if all of us in the room decided we're signing up for that, it would change our lives. Some of the heaviest, thickest, most difficult instruction, Jesus summarizes all of this in Matthew 7, verse 14. At the end of this section, Jesus will say, the gate is narrow and the road is hard in this life. And that's sort of the end of lecture number one. Years ago, when my daughters were young, I chaperoned a group of their classmates to the East Coast in my country to the General Conference, to our World Church Headquarters. And we took a tour. These are, you know, 13-year-olds because they love museums and tours and history. You know what 13-year-olds love? So we took them to the General Conference, and we took a tour of the building, and we ended up in the Ellen White Estate. At that time, it was in a different place in the building. Now it's been removed, it's been renovated. On the wall, there's a picture of um, one of Ellen White's vision, Christ of the Narrow Way. It looks something like this now. It didn't look like this years ago. The artist of this mural has done many paintings in my church at home in La Sierra. We know him well. We stood in front of the picture. The tour guide, the docent, explained to the 13-year-old children this vision, what Ellen White was saying, uh, and the message for the world. And we had one little child in our group who raised her hand and said to the tour guide, but but can you tell me what's happening to the the people who are falling off the path? Tour guide had a little bit of an awkward pause. Young adult, bless her heart, probably did this for community service hours for her university education. Bless her heart. A little bit of an awkward pause. She looked at the mural, she looked back at the child, and then she said, What we should notice is all the people who are on the path. Isn't that beautiful? The tour guide moved on. My little student did not. Be ye therefore perfect. The path is narrow. A lot of us are going to be falling off. Is this what the teaching from Jesus means? This is what I want to talk about this morning. Be ye therefore perfect. As our Father in heaven is perfect, King James translation. It's complicated to know why some voices gain traction in our heads and why others don't. It's complicated to know why this in particular has traction in my head all these years later. Remember on Sabbath when I told you about my grandmother who would kneel at the bedside and pray for her grandchildren? 
Those are the words that we remembered. Is that why we have traction on this command, be therefore perfect? Is it why we have traction with the way we've understood it? Is it Sabbath school teachers? Is it the, you know how trusting we are as parents to drop our children off at all the children's programming? We trust the voice of whoever's leading them, right? And I think of my child's mind driving by the Green Spot Tavern where all the sinners were locked up. Why does this have traction in our minds the way that it does? The word for perfect here in the original language, telos, teleos, the Greek word here, does not actually carry the implication of ethical perfection. And I want us to understand this today at least. The word telos or teleos in the original language simply means to become of age or to be built up with maturity or to completion or to reach towards a goal, right? That we would grow up and mature in a certain way. Be ye therefore perfect. But it isn't a word for ethical perfection of our actions. There are other words that can be used. This would not be that word. This would not be Jesus's uh, instruction then with this particular verse, I am giving you my uh, opinion and study this morning and this is what we'll be talking about today as we move around the camp, as you wait for tonight's meeting. This is not a word for ethical perfection. So we turn to the other gospel. This is what Bible study is. This is what our early Adventist heritage taught us. We turn to Luke because Luke has the same stories, right? Luke has the same sermon. Luke has the same difficult passages from Jesus about turn the other cheek and love your enemies and work for peace. And Luke has this same instruction, be ye therefore, but read with me, be ye therefore as your father. Completely different word. Luke reaches for a completely different word in the oikos vo vocabulary. This word helps, very helpful in the English translation. It actually leans towards compassion and mercy. Luke doesn't want to have this conversation with us this morning. He would be saying, what in the world are you people doing? We don't know always why different authors in Scripture reach for different words, friends. We don't have all the instructions why scribes don't all use the same language. It would help us all tremendously. Why Matthew uses one word, why Luke uses a different one. We can't answer all of these questions. Be therefore merciful. And so we turn back. We go back to, actually, by the way, uh, go to, um, we're going to go back to Matthew and we're going to read Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the very same passage. Ben, can you skip around to that one? Sorry for that. In a word, what I'm saying to you is grow up. This is the be ye therefore perfect passage. Grow up, your kingdom subjects. Live, live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives towards you. When Eugene Peterson digs to paraphrase, this is what he comes up with. Why did he lean that way and not kind of the more ethical perfection way? Maybe because the only other time the Gospel of Matthew uses this word for perfect, telos, teleos, is when we get to the story of the rich young ruler. And that matters because if we want to know what Matthew's Jesus means by this word, we go looking for other times that it's used in Scripture. So we move forward to the rich young ruler. You know that story because, because I see you and you do. <laughs> because you came to camp. This is the man who wants to know what he can do to be saved. And Jesus, uh, he says, I've kept all the commandments. I mean, do the commandments. Well, I've done those. Baby food, right? What else is there? That's when Jesus said, if you wish to be perfect, that's our word. If you wish telos or teleos, if you wish maturity, if you wish to complete your goal, if you wish to grow up, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving for he had too many possessions. Oh, goodness, Jesus, please don't make me do that. Right? That's our word right there in the rich young ruler story. Perfection is being linked to preferential treatment for the poor. Friends, do you see it the way I see it? Can you read that in the text too? Being perfect, preferential treatment for those who are without. And the young man leaves. And Matthew's Jesus is done. And that's all they tell us about this word. Matthew 23, however, 
When we move to the end of the gospel, can I read this part? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you tithe mint and till, dill and cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. What are the weightier matters? Justice and mercy. You've neglected justice, mercy, and faith. It's these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. When we want to understand what Matthew 5.48 means, we have to dabble in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And when we dabble in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that good for you, tithe payers, good for you with your mint and your, good for you, but you ignored the weightier matters of law. All your tithe pain did nothing to bring you closer to the Holy One. Turns out you're great commandment keepers and lousy kingdom partners. This is Matthew's Jesus on our passage this morning. We're now deep into Bible study. Is everybody okay? You need some steamed bread pudding? Not, uh, not what was it, Adam's brand? Ernest Adam's brand? Is that what it? Not that one, the one the pastor has in the back. Need some mock fish? I had my first mock fish here. We can talk about it later. In my home state, they would say, you need some fish tacos. We're deep in the Bible study now. Can we keep going? Because here's what happens. We now understand what Matthew is doing the word. We understand what Luke did with the word. So we sit still and we try and ask ourselves again, be ye therefore perfect. How have we come to the reading and the understand that we've come to? Don't be angry. Turn the other cheek. Help your, help, uh, work for peace in the world. If they persecute you, it will be because of me, because of what God has in mind. This is the cluster of teachings leading up Matthew 5 through 7 and the word love scattered throughout, scattered throughout. It'll be again and again and again. Jesus will use that word love, the love we have for each other. Live graciously towards each other the way God has lived graciously towards you and I. We are not talking about sinless perfection living here. If we want that passage, this won't be it. We might need to study other passages in Scripture, but this morning we can't use this text for that purpose. Time doesn't allow for us to do the same with Ellen White uh, uh, sentence or two there. We could do the same, and we ought to do the same with Ellen White's words, only knowing we use this to open up conversations, never to shut them down. Would you agree to that? We use her words to open up the conversations. Jesus' instructions are clear. He gives us all we need. Go back to our tents and think about it. If we stopped with Matthew 5, his instructions are very clear. This isn't a teaching about how to keep the sin from getting in. This is a teaching about how to let generosity get out. That's what's been going on in Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. So why is it we get ingrained with other interpretations of Scripture? Where do the voices in our head come from? It's a question we should all be asking. It's a question we ought to ask when we're teaching our children and our grandchildren. As it's coming out of my mouth, my mother would often say to us, I don't know why, how you got that idea. We didn't teach you that at home. Where did that come from? I was driving my husband's car to work uh, several months ago. Something was wrong with my car, I got into his car. And as I approached my church, my uh, Sabbath morning, all of a sudden a music file, a sound file began to play. It's one I had never heard before. I'm just within a couple blocks of my church. I'm gonna show you a video of what this looks like and sounds like in my neighborhood. It's coming up the street. I'm the building on the corner. church bells go off when you get close to my church the church bells go off in his car <laughs> and it's awesome says a pastor like for a full minute church bells go off I'm where's this noise coming from I'm looking all around and I realize it's kind, he's programmed his car so when he gets close to the church the church bells go off So when I see him at church a couple of hours later, I'm like, can we talk about your car for a minute? What is it with the church bells? He said, don't you want to know where you're going? I'm like, I know where I'm going. (laughs) 
listen, for 11 years, my car has driven up to that church on Sabbath morning on almost every day. I know where I'm going. Yeah, but don't you want to know, like the church bells tell you, I'm going to church and we're getting ready to worship and don't you want to have that soundtrack in your head? Because when my husband puts the church bells on his car, when he comes to church, it prepares him, right? This made so much more sense when I borrowed his car to, and I picked him up from his work one day. Listen what happens. This is the soundtrack when he drives up to Loma Linda University Health in California. It's the Kentucky Bugie, it's the Kentucky Derby bugle call, right? That's when you line the horses up and the horse race is getting ready and everybody's buckled in and they're fastened down and they're getting ready to be released and go. Oh, that makes so much more sense to me now. When he drives up to work, he needs like that charge. He's, he's got to get ready and like stand up tall and, and act right and be ready to produce and jump into the big pond now where all the people are and big things need to happen. He needs to hear the Kentucky Derby call when he goes to work. What I want to ask you this morning, and we're going to go carefully now, what I want to ask you this morning is if we have substituted the soundtracks in our head where I might need to hear church bells, I am hearing the Kentucky Derby Buell call for my Christian journey. The one that calls me to attention, tells me, tells me to stand up straight and tall, tells me to perform and produce and to get it right. Does anybody have that too in their own head? I wonder this morning if I'm hearing the wrong soundtrack when I show up for life with Jesus and life with God. Now, if you were here at Spirit Led in 2017, we did a little exercise. That was very few of us. But I want to suggest to you why we hear such a soundtrack. And we're going to use um, a couple of you from the audience who are keen on doing tug of war right here on this side of the platform. Don't be shy. Because if I have to look up and make eye contact, I will pick you. A couple of you, maybe younger ones would be easier. We got a sturdy rope. It's not gonna, it doesn't have to go all the way to the end. And it's not going to be me and Pastor Adrian doing this. So to have a couple of you who will come forward, fantastic. Here we go. So I want to suggest to you that we've got several soundtracks in our brains, those of us with our Bibles open and maybe those of us in conservative Christianity. Oh, dear. Oh, we are going to go all the way across now. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. You're going to have to bet. Yeah, we need like 50 more people. Ah. <laughs> now he's worried about his guitar. Now he's worried about his guitar. Here's what I'd like to suggest. Yeah, while a couple more people get over here, we'll give you one more. In the Bible, we have more than one prominent voice we listen to when we think about how to live in these embodied bodies around the world. You can just relax for a minute, and I'd just be saying, be say, be saying a silent prayer. She's organized. Oh, she's going to win over here. Ah, oh, Kentucky Derby Buell Call people. That's the soundtrack in your head. That's fantastic. Okay, be calm. You have a minute. Loosen up. It's going to be okay. I'm going to tell you before you go. We need one more. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. Here, all right. Can you watch me and not them for a minute? Watch the piano. We'll give you all the instructions. It's going to be okay. Nobody's going over the end, we hope. <laughs> Two voices in Scripture I would like to call attention to. Early in our story, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, we hear early the voice that tells us we're not going back to Egypt. We've already been slaves. We've already done that once. What can we do to protect ourselves so we don't have to go back to Egypt? And the commands come and the instructions come. All the thou shalt nots in the book of Leviticus, we know some of those are unusual laws, right? 
These are sort of the priestly voice in the community that begins to develop that tells people, you need to separate yourself. You need to remain spotless. You need a sacrifice. This is how you'll keep from going back to Egypt. This is a strong voice in the Old Testament all the way through, this priestly voice that reminds us how to behave well. You want to be a slave again? No, I don't. Well, then separate yourself from the rest of the world. Remain spotless. That's the sinless thing. And bring your sacrifices and cross your fingers, and hopefully God will have favor on you people. That's a strong voice in the Old Testament. These people are going to represent that voice here. You are the sinless sacrifice, spotless, separate, that group. And the folks out in front of you are going to chant you on. So hang on, that's voice one. This is voice two. Later in the Old Testament, the prophetic voice comes in. That was the voice we heard in Jesus. How dare you people, you tithe cumin and mint, and you forget about the what? The weightier matters of the law like justice and mercy. Later in scripture comes the prophetic voice that says, no, you need to mix with the people. You need to mend things with the people. You need to mingle. How can you be God's presence on earth when you keep separating yourselves? So by the time we get to Jesus, and later when we get to the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul is working things out case study by case study by case study, it's because the people have these soundtracks in their head. If you've come from the Israelite tradition, you know at least these two dominant soundtracks. That's my thesis this morning. Mix, mingle, mend. The people on this half are going to shout and cheer you on with that little chant. Let's practice. Mix, mingle, mend. Try one more time. Mix, mingle, mend. It will take all of you in your outside voices. Mix, mingle, mend. Perfect. On this side, we're going to... You hear your, you hear your leader? Yeah, she doesn't want anything to be unfair, so you people shout louder, she says. <laughs> Did you say we've got Jesus? I'm not sure you wanted to start that argument back there, my friend. So our chant on this site, see, those were all M's, mix, mingle, men. We're making it easy for ourselves, mix, mingle, men. Over here, our chant's all S's. Are you ready for that? It's going to be separate. Sacrifice, spotless. Separate, sacrifice, spotless. You gotta use your voices. Separate, sacrifice, spotless. One more time. Separate, sacrifice, spotless. You are mix, mingle, mend. When I say go, we're having a tug of war and you're cheering them on. Are you ready, friends? One, two, three, go. Ah, 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 ah. Did you give up? Did you forfeit? No, I thought from what you were saying once we let it go. You <laughs> <laughs> Whoever, what's your name? Andrea. Andrea, you are you should be up here. <laughs> Andrea's like, oh, I thought the instruction was to let go and forfeit. <laughs> Paul, it was a tug of war. These are thank you. You can all can you please give them a hand again? <laughs> so it is when we ask ourselves, where do we get these soundtracks in our head? We don't need to be beating ourselves up. We don't beat ourselves up or beat up our ancestors or our pastors or our priests or the voices that have shaped us. Do, does that make sense? We came to these soundtracks legitimately with the Bible open, trying to understand how do we not go back to Egypt Try and understand how do we be people of God in this world, in the mess that we are in. Remember on Sabbath, I talked to you about Rabbi Harold Kushner in a tiny little book, How Good Do I Have to Be? And Harold Kushner says, this is why we go all the way back to the beginning of the story. Because we have these tapes in our head. And we ask ourselves again, how we tell the story, our story with God. Ours could be a story of, uh, of um, I'd like to do the other one first, Ben. A story of misbehavior and punishment in God's world. That, in fact, God gave us an, an instruction and we couldn't comply and obey. And since then, ours has been a story with God of misbehavior and punishment. Ours has been a punitive story with a God. And if we can get it right, maybe by the end of this story, God will love us well. 
This is actually not a statement about us. This is a statement about God, about the tentative nature of God's love, about the tentative nature about God's forgiveness, about a fussy God watching us. Rabbi Kushner suggests there's a more faithful way we can tell our story. On Sabbath, we suggested, we say instead, that ours is a story of the complexity of being human in this world, that in these bodies, we will, be, we will make mistakes, that in these bodies, we will find imperfect human beings walking around the world, that I will wound you today, that you will wound me, that we will do with our humanity things we wish we wouldn't have later. That's actually a statement about a God with grace and love. Not who needed a perfect creation, who needed a creation paying attention. Ours is not a story, then, with God that's primarily punitive, a better way to tell the story. What's the evidence for this? Because when Adam and Eve show up to the Creator in the cool of the day and they are hiding where they were naked and unashamed, they are now naked and they feel shame, and the first thing God says to them is, who told you you were naked? Who put that tape in your head? Where did you get that idea? Where did that sense come from? Who are you listening to? I'm your creator. There is a more faithful way to tell the story. There's a more faithful way of being human in this story. We're born into the predicament. We are not born as the predicament. So ours is a story of pain and wonder and complexity, and we will wound each other. And that's what Psalm 51 is for. And that's what confession is for. And that's what forgiveness is for. It turns out God, I don't believe God needs a bunch of perfect creatures moving around the world in the end. That puts us in the center of the story rather than allowing God to be in the center of God's story. This is why I visit so many bedsides in 20 years now. The, the thick file in my computer is the sermon and preaching file. The second large file is death and funerals. And this is why as I visit bedsides of those with terminal diagnoses and in the last hours or minutes of their life, I hear so many people still wondering and lamenting if they've been good enough for God to save. It turns out it's simply not enough for a couple of preachers or more to come through camp this weekend and tell us, lay down that tape in your head. We don't get rid of it that easy but we can begin to identify it now and begin starting to tell a better story. Maybe, in some of our cases, it will we'll need to be aggressive. So you've been watching a little Maria Con Marie Kondo last year because two-thirds of you New Zealanders are on Netflix. She was the sensation last year, right, in the States. She's the one who tells you to tidy up and do that by uh, uh, taking everything out, holding it up, looking at it, thanking it, and then releasing it from its service, <laughs> right? Maybe we need to do that with some teachings in our church, some spiritual practices. Maybe we need to kind of start to unpack things and hold them up to the light of day, thank them for their service, and release them. Perhaps the idea that we will be perfect humans in this world is one of those ideas we could release, though don't donate it or give it away. Put it in the trash bin, friends. Remember on Sabbath, we also talked about this word epigenetics, that it is our body keeps track of things that have happened, trauma in particular, in prior generations, that our genes are specifically influenced. Let me repeat again the short story from, from a Sunday that we talked about, that our genes keep track and, and uh, what has happened to us and happened to our families begins to layer up here. So that the 1944 potato starvation or the Dutch winter of starvation, when the Nazis discontinued food supply through the country of the Netherlands because the railroad workers wouldn't comply with the German government, so they shut the food off during a short period of time. 20,000 people die. I told you this on Sunday. During that period of time, pregnant women did eventually give birth to children, and we learn later that those children are more likely to have a higher increase of triglycerides in their blood level, their ha higher incidence of diabetes, higher incidence of obesity, a higher incidence of schizophrenia. And we begin to ask the question, how is it that children two and three generations can suffer from the trauma of a life they didn't even lead? 
How is it those of us born in populations and islands in spaces where colonists and conquerors came, how is it we build up that trauma in our own skin? And so the children of conquered peoples carry around in them their bodies have been shaped, their genes, the very genes that make them who they are, have been shaped by the trauma of the prior generations. It's Brene Brown in my country who says that perfection, the word perfect and perfectionism doesn't protect us from getting hurt, it protects us from being seen. Many specialists now saying in wellness communities, in the healing arts, in the social sciences, in the biological science, many specialists now saying we ought to all get rid of the word perfect from our own vocabularies. This is not because it's culturally trendy, it's because it's damaging and it's been wrong. So maybe in the Christian tradition, we have cultivated what I call theological epigenetics. That's a word you can write down. If you're troubled by it, it's a Chris Oberg word. If you're going to quote me, it's a Chris Oberg word. I'll take all of the condemnation. I'm playing with the idea and working it out. What if there's something called theological epigenetics? That is, we have taught some things along the way that have done damage. We have taught some ideas that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation, we might need to take some ideas out of the drawer, hold them up, think about them, thank them for their service, apologize for their disservice, and release them from our teaching anymore. I believe teaching the idea of a perfect, sinless generation that exists on this earth before Jesus comes is one of those such ideas. I think we could release it from our service and move on. We have what we could call uninterrogated theological trauma. These are the tapes in our head. These are the voices in our head between mix, mingle, mend, and sacrifice, separate, um, uh, all the priest and the prophetic voice. Then we have the layers of the other generations who probably did not mean to do us harm, church. Someone might be asking this morning, <laughs> where is the good news in any of this? Where's the good news here? This is just a mess. I need another cuppa and my Panadol. At the same time, preferably. Here's some good news for me, a child of the Sabbath. That one day in seven is the day we gather to remind ourselves we are not the savior of our own story. It's the one day we remind ourselves we have trust in the one who does own our story. It's the day we lay down the burden again to the soundtrack from the Kentucky race tracks. This is the day we look at each other and remind ourselves we have one Savior. It's none of us. Sabbath is the day we declare again that we trust in God and we trust God's story. There is some good news here. Every Sabbath we gather, we could be reminding ourselves, wait, not that, but this. Where's the good news in all of this? Well, here's one more. We are still here and the broken world is out here. It turns out if this is a teaching about how to let the generosity get out, we have a world in need of generous people. And today is simply one more day. And when you leave camp, it's one more week to go home. Recluster as a church, as a board of elders, as a group of leaders in your church and say, knowing what we know, how to be children of the Jesus movement, what ought we care about now in our church and community? That's one more bit of good news. My country is as broken today as it's ever been. I just checked my headlines the calls for prayer and fasting across my country today are deep. The world is in trauma. And God still has you and I, for some reason, right here. I'm going to leave you with these words from Linda Underwood. She's a poet. All this talk of saving souls is the name of her poem. Souls weren't made to save like Sunday clothes that give out at the seams. Souls are made to wear. 
They come with lifetime guarantees. Don't save your soul. Pour it out like rain on cracked, parched earth. Give your soul away or pass it like a candle flame. Sing it out or laugh it up to the wind. Souls were made for hearing, breaking hearts. Souls are made for hearing, puzzling dreams, for remembering August flowers, February flowers, or forgetful hurt, hurts, forgetting hurts. These men who talk of saving souls, they have the look of bullies who blow out candles before you sing happy birthday, and they want the world to be in alphabetical order. I'll spin my soul, playing it out like sticky string into the world, so I can catch every last thing. I touch. What if it is that God is hoping you and I will spend these souls? Let's pray. We sit still, Spirit. Give us space today to exchange the soundtracks of our soul. With sit still spirit, we are listening to you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for community. Thank you for your presence even now as we process. Thank you for our church, a place where we can go to think these things over. We are listening just now, God. And we sing our way out today with that chorus we sang this morning, Blessed Assurance, This Is My Story. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, Amen, church. Amen.